to have uh, spent the past year at TSC. Thank you for having me as a visitor. Um, in the spirit of it being a keynote talk, I'm mostly going to focus on big picture questions and on issues that I think uh, are important to resolve that remain uh, unresolved. But I will touch on a couple of uh, papers I've written um, on these issues as well. Um, so we all know that uh, drastically reducing fossil fuels and it's, oh, okay, greenhouse gases uh, is necessary for combating climate change so that hopefully we have fewer 38, 39, 40 degree days like the one outside. Um, uh, but of course, when you reduce fossil fuel use, you also reduce emissions of air pollutants that are associated with burning fossil fuels like sulfur dioxide and uh, nitrous oxide uh, and fine particulate matter. Um, we know that these pollutants affect human health, and this has been long recognized as a co-benefit of climate change policy. Of course, you know, ideally we regulate these things separately and wisely, but in practice, we don't always. Uh, and so we can ask ourselves the question, if we address uh, climate change, what will that mean for human health in terms of the air pollution uh, reductions? Now, of course, that uh, the answer depends on how harmful air pollution is to human health and for other outcomes. Um, and you'd think that after, you know, economists jumped on uh, the health effects of air pollution bandwagon more than two decades ago, we'd have a pretty good answer. But I'm going to argue that we actually don't except that we know pollution is bad for you, which um, is pretty clear. Um, but as far as the magnitude of this harm, I think we still have a ways to go, um, especially in places where air pollution levels are already low. There, the evidence on how much beneficial further reductions would be um, is not that clear. Um, to motivate why this question is important, um, I've graphed air pollution levels in the United States uh, from the time that widespread monitoring began to uh, today. Um, I normalized each pollutant to 100 in the first year of widespread um, monitoring. And you can see that air pollution levels um, in the US have fallen drastically since the early 1970s. And there are similar trends for uh, Europe as well. In particular, SO2, which is emitted largely by coal-fired power plants, has fallen by more than 90% uh, percent over this time uh, period. Uh, nitrous oxide, um, which is, uh, or nitrogen dioxide, sorry, uh, uh, which has also fallen by um, over 70%. Percent. And then total suspended particulates, uh, another uh, pollutant uh, that is not just from fossil fuel, but fossil fuels are uh, also responsible for a non-trivial share of it, uh, have fallen by less so. Part of this is um, changes in monitoring compositions because uh, we've realized that total suspended particulates are not as bad as smaller particles. So we stopped monitoring TSP. We started monitoring uh, PM10, which is um, Oh, any particle 10 micrometers or smaller in diameter, then we realized even smaller particles are bad, so we started monitoring PM2.5. So there are some compositional changes here that kind of explain this um, flattening out. Uh, but even if you look at uh, PM10, which we started monitoring uh, in the late, uh, in, in the early 1990s, and then PM2.5, which we started monitoring in the United States in uh, 1999, um, since widespread monitoring, there's been a reduction of 40%. So air pollution levels have fallen by quite a bit in the United States. Uh, if you consider places like China and India that are burning a lot of coal, their SO2 levels are really high. Uh, we want these places to decarbonize. Um, we, and that will mean that uh, air pollution will go down as well. And so what kind of benefits will this have? That, I think, is a really important um, question. Now, here's why answering this um, question is difficult. Um, first, uh, air pollution is not as good as randomly assigned. It's associated with economic activity, with driving, with electricity use, with burning fossil fuels, uh, and so on. Uh, as economists, uh, 
we know pretty well how to deal with that conceptually, but finding good quasi-experimental variation in practice can be uh, difficult. Uh, something that the literature has realized lately is the problem is that ambient air pollution levels are also measured with error. So typically, you have monitoring stations uh, that are measuring pollution in a specific point, and then you have the population which lives nearby, but of course, the measurements at the monitor might be a noisy proxy for what people are actually experiencing. And that kind of measurement error, if it's classical, can create attenuation bias. Uh, even with products where you have satellite sensed uh, pollution can have this kind of error as well. Uh, potentially not as bad as a single monitor, uh, but nonetheless uh, could cause your estimates to be um, attenuated. Um, then sort of less econometric -y, more big picture issues is that air pollution might have delayed um, health effects. So ideally you want to measure the total effect of given unit of exposure um, up uh, you know, through infinity, that is very difficult uh, to do. But if you're not measuring delayed health effects, you're not capturing the full effects of uh, air pollution. Alternatively, or in addition to, uh, increases in air pollution might kill people who would have died uh, soon anyway, regardless of this shock. This is known as mortality displacement. And soon is in quotes because it's not clear how soon is. If we knew that, we could obviously account for it. Uh, it could be that air pollution uh, you know, kills people who would have lived for another year, another three years, or just another month. So it's really important to know for uh, if you believe that kind of value of statistical life should be adjusted for how long you would have lived and that somebody who would have lived uh, you know, for 10 more years absent a shock uh, at more than somebody who would have lived for 10 more days, which I think most economists at least do, then this is really important to um, account for. Uh, and a fifth major problem is that people might take defensive actions um, like uh, buy medication or relocate somewhere else to counteract the negative health effects of air pollution. Uh, now, this is a good thing as far as minimizing the health effects, but as far as understanding the cost of air pollution, this makes it harder. Because at the extreme, uh, if there's really expensive medication that perfectly offsets any health effects, and I take it and you don't see any measured health effects on me, uh, you might erroneously conclude that air pollution is costless. But in fact, I had to undertake a very costly investment in order to avoid uh, these negative um, health effects. So just to, um, for the rest of the talk, have some taxonomy of what I'm talking about, um, there is a couple of effects of air pollution that we can measure. So we can have a short run exposure to air pollution, let's say one day of higher pollution levels, and then a measured effect that's uh, over the same time frame or maybe a bit longer, like three to five days um, a month. And I would consider that uh, the short run effect of short run exposure. So the exposure period is short, and the time frame over which you're measuring the outcome is um, short. Um, that is undesirable because there could be delayed effects and because there could be mortality displacement, right? So this doesn't give you a full picture of the cost of air pollution. Uh, so what can you do? Well, you can extend the time period over which you measure the effect. And that will get you the long run effect of short run exposure. And that is something that you can use for uh, policy, assuming that you don't have people undertaking uh, any defensive uh, investments or uh, other uh, mitigative behaviors. Um, and then what you can also do is find you know, a good uh, exogenous source of longer run exposure. Why is this useful? Because um, a, you know, a series of short run exposures might not be additive. They might not have additive health effects. And so then you actually need to measure what would be the long run effect of long run um, exposure. It could be concave, it could be convex. Uh, it might be additive. That is something that uh, we don't uh, know very well. Um, so that brings me to kind of the state of the uh, economics literature uh, today. Um, and that is that the best identified studies focus on outcomes that are measured over fairly short time frames 
following the pollution exposure. And I know I'm missing a lot of studies, including by some of the people in this room. This is just to give you um, an idea of where the literature is. Um, so there's a large literature on um, infant mortality and air pollution um, exposure. Uh, the reason that um, you know infants are somewhat attractive to studies because they haven't been alive very long, so you can measure their lifetime exposure to pollution uh, fairly well. Um, so there's um, you know a study that looks at birth weight and prematurity, right? So uh, immediately after the infants are born, and then makes conclusions about long run. Uh, outcomes based on an association between low birth weight and, uh, and prematurity, but doesn't empirically measure what happens to these infants over a longer period of time. Um, then there's a paper that looks at uh, weekly infant mortality. Again, doesn't measure what happens to kind of longer run infant mortality. Uh, and if these infants are infants that would have died soon anyway, or maybe they're infants that would have lived for um, 80 more years. Uh, we have a similar picture on for adults. So these are all you know, well-identified studies. Um, and we have outcomes that are daily, um, sometimes going out to monthly, like um, Hollingsworth et al. 2021, sometimes going as far out as, um, as 90 days. And the longest ones, there's two studies that look at annual mortality. But even there, you might ask, OK, annual mortality goes up. But what would have happened over two years? There are these people that would have lived for uh, 10 more years, 20 more years, two more years. Uh, without looking over a longer time frame, uh, it's very hard to determine this uh, empirically. Uh, OK, so are there studies that look over longer periods of time? There are very few. Um, one example is um, Bereka et al. that studies um, reductions in uh, sulfur dioxide pollution as a result of the acid uh, rain program and finds that there are larger cross-sectional mortality decreases in counties that experience larger reductions uh, in SO2. And that uh, these mortality reductions also grow over time, so they're smaller immediately uh, after uh, the beginning of this program, and then uh, they become larger. Now, one way to interpret this is that this is, um, you know, this is telling us that we can't just add up shorter run effects to get longer run effects, uh, but this is cross-sectional uh, data. And so what the study uh, cannot capture, and this is the, uh, the challenge that uh, studies that measure longer run outcomes uh, face, is whether these are the same people that are uh, dying, right? So when you have an air pollution shock, uh, and you know there's studies showing all of this, right? People might respond by moving, right? So there's a big hedonic literature about how much people uh, value clean air, and so if air pollution goes down uh, or goes up, you might have resorting of people into neighborhoods. That in itself can have um, health effects. Uh, air pollution can also affect labor markets, which could have consequences for uh, your um, health. Uh, the health effects themselves can affect your labor market outcomes. So there is basically a lot of complex mechanisms tied to air pollution exposure, which makes it really hard to be sure that you're really picking up this link between you know, air pollution, health, and mortality. That's the outcome that you're interested in. Now, you know, why don't you just want this reduced form relationship between air pollution and uh, mortality? Well, as I mentioned, because all of these things could moderate the health impact. And at the extreme, you might find that, uh, even in a well-identified study, that there's no uh, causal effect of pollution on mortality. But that's all because people take medicine or uh, other defensive investments. Um, in response. Alternatively, you can also overestimate the health effects of air pollution. So we don't really know which uh, way the bias um, goes. OK, so where do we go from uh, here? Right. So I think assessing the counterfactual survival of those who are killed by air pollution is really important for understanding the welfare consequences of air pollution reduction. And I see uh, two uh, options that uh, are not mutually exclusive. I think we should be trying um, both of them. 
One is to uh, do more work considering mortality impacts over different time windows following air pollution shocks. So um, now I think papers are starting to do this, and it's really great because previously people would kind of look at uh, you know contemporaneous pollution shock, contemporaneous change uh, in outcomes, and that doesn't give you enough to understand um, the f well, full welfare um, impacts. Now, of course. Um, if you extend the time period T over which you look at the effects of air pollution, eventually the effect of air pollution on mortality will go to zero. Um, in the long run, we're all dead. Like in 200 years, it doesn't matter how much pollution we were all um, exposed to, right? So in some sense, the goal of the research should be to measure what is this time period capital T over which the effect of uh, pollution on mortality disappears. And that informs um, the counterfactual survival of those um, affected, uh, right? Are, like, is air pollution kind of like a car accident? Uh, in that, if you escape being killed in a car accident, you're probably in good shape for a really long time. Or is it more like, you know, somebody who is very unhealthy and has a heart attack? Even if they survive that heart attack, they're at a very high risk of another one that will kill them sooner, right? And we don't really know, uh, oh well, we, we're getting better understanding of what kind of shock pollution is, but I don't think we're uh, fully there. So why doesn't everybody just do option one? Uh, because statistical power may quickly become an issue, right? So especially if you're looking at a daily or a weekly shock and you're trying to see what happens over 10 years, that's just statistically not feasible. Even with an annual shock, um, after 10 years, you might not have the right data to track the mortality of the people uh, or you might have, um, like, again, statistical uh, power issues. Uh, the second option uh, that I am actually personally excited about um, and am actively working on is to uh, use data to model counterfactual uh, survival of people. So kind of combine what, what I think a lot of good papers have done lately, not just in this literature, but um, in economics in general, is combine well-identified uh, estimates with a structural approach to get the best of um, both uh, worlds. Uh, and the advantage of this method is that it's not limited by the length of the follow-up window. So if you model counterfactual survival well, in principle, you could look at a daily shock and you could look at uh, daily um, counterfactual survival, and you could get uh, you know, the long run effect of short run exposure at least, which we uh, still do not um, have. Uh, now the downside is that this is data intensive as I'll demonstrate uh, with a few examples and it also requires uh, some assumptions because it partly involves structural work. But I think it's a promising way uh, forward. Um, so here's an example of the second approach um, from my recent paper with Garth Hutel, um, Nolan Miller, David Molitor, and uh, Julian Reif. Um, and you're gonna kind of have to trust me that the identification here is good, right? We have um, an instrument for a one day increase in uh, fine particulate um, matter. Uh, and then we see what happens to mortality over the following three days. So the day of the shock and the subsequent um, two days. Uh, and in terms of mortality, we find, and this is, um, you know, I say all age, this is actually data on the U.S. elderly, uh, where we have access to administrative records uh, from Medicare, the health insurance for the elderly. So this is all um, elderly. We find that all age mortality over the day of the shock and the subsequent two days goes up by 0 0.85 deaths per um, uh, million. Um, and then to understand what this means in terms of how many life years are lost as opposed to just how many um, lives, we model the counterfactual survival of the people who died using Medicare records. So what we're able to observe is essentially every single claim that they have with Medicare. Um, and we use machine create basically a survival model and we assume that people who died had that not had they not died would have followed that uh, survival model going forward and this makes a big difference for valuing the life the counterfactual life expectancy of people killed by um, air pollution so this column shows what happens to life years lost so here we have lives 
And then basically what we do is um, for every person who died, we assign them um, a different counterfactual life expectancy. So here, we just take the average life expectancy for the Medicare population as a whole, which is o slightly over 11 years. And we assume every person who uh, dies would have lived for 11 years uh, otherwise. So this is what would happen if the person killed by air pollution was just a random individual plucked from this um, population. And then you get that a one unit increase in uh, PM2.5, uh, which is about 10% of the mean uh, during this uh, time period in our sample, uh, loses about 9.7 uh, life years per million individuals, right? And of course, you can multiply whatever your um, preferred value for uh, a life year is, you can multiply this to get uh, the dollar um, amount. And this is obviously just this estimate scaled by um, this average uh, life years lost per uh, decedent. Um, then uh, you can do kind of a bit better, and this is something that some studies do, um, just account for the age and sex of the people that um, died. Uh, we know that on average, and we showed that on average, pollution kills um, older people, so you can adjust for that. And even just that adjustment will take three uh, life years lost, so it will take about uh, a third of the estimate from uh, your uh, counterfactual. Um, and then here we also um, add chronic conditions. So Medicare has flags for a variety of chronic conditions. That reduces the um, estimate further. And then when you uh, do machine learning with thousands of predictors of life expectancy um, thrown in, uh, the estimate was reduced to less than a third of what kind of the naive approach would be. So uh, the counterfactual life expectancy um, of the typical, here we calculate what it would be per complier, is um, three and a half years. Now that's actually still not small, right? So it might make you think, well, then you know these uh, short run shocks don't matter. But even though this is you know smaller than average, it, when added up over millions of individuals, uh, you still get annual benefits of uh, air pollution reduction uh, per unit of about uh, 24 uh, billion uh, dollars, right? So I think this is a, a promising approach going forward if you have this kind of data, regardless of what is the time frame of the shock that you're looking at, whether it's one day or one year, um, is explicitly modeling counterfactual life expectancy of um, those who are killed by um, air pollution. Uh, now I'm going to uh, use a, a more recent work of mine to talk about um, the other approach, and that is the structural model. Um, and here we're really able to demonstrate that there's both delayed effects and short-run mortality displacement going on, and they're um, important to account for. Um, so here we're um, taking a step back to uh, 1972 to 1988. Uh, the time when SO2 concentrations in the United States were um, quite uh, high. Uh, so you can you know, kind of think about India and uh, China today to, to first um, approximation. Possibly India and China are, are um, even worse. And uh, we use uh, daily changes in wind direction as an instrument for uh, changes in sulfur dioxide concentrations. Um, lots of controls. Again, I kind of want to focus on bigger picture things here, so you'll just have to Trust me that um, it's all well uh, identified. Um, and then our dependent variable is um, county level um, accumulative mortality over X days following the shocks, where X is on the X axis up here. So basically, we're uh, doing option one and empirically tracing out how long uh, people would have lived in absence of the uh, and also delayed effects. Right? So this is going to pick up the net um, of the two. Um, and when you look at all-cause mortality, you see that on net there are delayed effects. As you extend the time window uh, further out, the shock is still the same. It's always a one-day increase in sulfur dioxide. The estimated mortality impacts um, grow. Uh, and when you look, break it down by cause, uh, you know, it looks about a third due to uh, cardiovascular causes, uh, a third due to other, and a third due to cancer. And of course, the cancer um, cause of death should make you suspicious. 
uh, because you can't develop cancer and die from it as a result of an air pollution shock uh, in one day. So this is already evidence that air pollution uh, is killing individuals who probably were already pretty sick um, anyway. Uh, when we look at how this looks at the end of the 28-day window, um, the cancer mortality has gone to zero. So, and, and you know, kind of goes to zero after about two weeks. So what this is saying is that when it comes to uh, cancer, that about a third of the individuals uh, who died on the day of pollution uh, would have uh, lived uh, less than 14 uh, days, depending on if, if, when you want to see if when it goes to zero and when it ceases to be um, statistically uh, significant. So uh, as we might expect, air pollution is definitely killing uh, people who are in very bad health. Um, but uh, when it comes to cardiovascular and these other causes of which uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, so um, respiratory-related disease um, is a big one, uh, this does not go to zero. So it, it suggests that we can't just assume, you know, it's all mortality displacement. We can't assume that none of it is mortality displacement. We really have to think hard about counterfactual um, life expectancy. So that leads us to propose a new approach, uh, and that is leveraging a structural model, which we've used in many other settings. Uh, so why not when it comes to health effects of uh, air pollution? And the reason we propose this is because uh, estimating the long-run effects of air pollution with quasi-experimental methods has proven difficult. So uh, I'm not aware of um, any studies that sort of have a definitive answer to this. And this could be a nice complementary um, approach uh, because we still don't have a good answer to um, how much life expectancy in the U.S. improved as a result of pollution declines, for example. Um, and organizations such as the World Health Organization, the environmental protection agencies, while some of them are using some of the um, well-identified estimates, a lot of them are still relying on uh, epidemiological estimates. And one reason is because when it comes to epidemiological estimates, if you're not restricting yourself to be well identified, um, then you can look over any time periods that you want, right? So they can uh, deliver the answers that policymakers want in terms of the units, um, but they're not necessarily the right answers. And so uh, if we want to, you know, sort of be competitive uh, when it comes to estimates being used for policy, we need to get uh, better estimates. And this is where I think well-identified short-run estimates combined with a dynamic model of health uh, to predict longer-run uh, impacts can be very useful. So I'll talk about um, the proposed model, and this is actually not... Uh, our model, it's a general model of mortality developed by uh, Yaris, Mooney, and Moreau, which I think in some sense gives it nice external validity because uh, we're not cherry picking it for uh, our purpose. Um, we're, take, we're, we're not just making it up for our purpose. It's um, a good model in general. Uh, so this model posits that you have um, some health capital at time t, where t can either be measured in years or in days. Uh, that depends the last period, uh, minus some depreciation parameter, which uh, we can um, conceptualize as some constant delta times t to the alpha, plus some investment term, plus um, an IIB health shock. You have some initial uh, distribution of health given to you at um, birth. Uh, and so this is a model that depends on five parameters, mu, delta, alpha, i, and squared. Um, in this model, death occurs, uh, so this is latent health, right? We don't observe this. Uh, when latent health falls below a threshold, uh, 8 lower bar, which can be set to 0 without loss of generality, uh, you die. When it falls um, below uh, each lower bar for the first time, um, this model was developed to capture a variety of real-world mortality dynamics. Um, so by parameterizing it, uh, you can capture rectangularization of survival, where more people are making it to advanced ages like uh, 80, 85, and so on. But there's a sharp drop off, you know, around age 100, and not many people uh, are making it past that. So kind of survival curves are becoming more like a rectangle. 
Um, it can also capture uh, socioeconomic gradients with this parameter I, where some people have uh, more of an endowment than others, and that explains why they um, live longer. Um, importantly, for thinking about the health of air pollution, uh, it can capture scarring effects. So if I um, depreciate your health once for a period of time, let's say through a pollution shock, uh, you might not die in that time period. It depends on uh, whether or not you're healthy. Like if you're a pretty healthy individual, if your HD is high, and I shock you for one period of time, uh, you will probably be fine. But because your health tomorrow depends on your health today, uh, your health will be permanently lower than somebody who didn't receive that shock. And that will uh, produce a scarring effect or a delayed effect, um, if you will, on mortality. Um, this model can also capture mortality displacement. Um, if you increase H lower bar temporarily, uh, what will happen is the individuals who are the sickest will uh, die. But then because you now have this gap in the distribution, if H bar, lower bar reverts to where it was before, um, you're going to have a decrease in, in mortality. And that's the mortality uh, displacement uh, effect. Uh, so what we do in this paper is we calibrate uh, this model using a period uh, life table from uh, the 1970s, kind of the time period of our study. Um, it doesn't capture um, infant mortality uh, very well, but we actually don't detect increases um, in infant mortality, and we're still working on um, calibrating this. You know, here are the model uh, parameters. You know, uh, the units don't really um, matter, except to the extent that they fit the actual survival curve pretty well. We simulated with um, a million uh, agents. Um, so here are some example health trajectories that can come out of this model. Um, this is simulated using those parameters. So there's four people here. Um, at birth, uh, they have, you know, the um, standard deviation of health is uh, pretty low. And then you can see that um, they follow fairly different trajectories uh, in life. On average, health initially increases because there's this and when you're young, depreciation is um, low because, uh, you know, it's uh, T alpha, so T is low. Uh, so your health stock is growing. Um, and then eventually, um, you know, as uh, the depreciation parameter starts becoming important, people um, die. So this person uh, made it to over 80 years old. This person dies at 70. This person dies um, at 60. And this person, you know, gets unlucky and dies at 50, notice that this person comes pretty close to death a couple of times, uh, but manages you know, with, with lucky shocks, uh, manages to um, survive for another decade. So this also kind of hits at that this model can be used to, uh, to uh, think about counterfactual life expectancy, provided they think it's uh, well calibrated. Um, how long would these people have, have lived uh, who uh, did not get killed by um, air pollution. Um, so once you have a baseline fit for this model, you need to think about how air pollution changes the underlying health parameters, right? So the basic idea is that, of course, uh, air pollution will um, kill some people, uh, but then the people that it doesn't kill, it might weaken so that they um, live uh, less long. Uh, maybe they die uh, three days later, maybe five days later. Uh, maybe it just makes them a tiny bit more likely to die um, five years from, um, from now. Uh, and so basically what you can do is you can take your uh, regression estimates on daily mortality and you can use those to calibrate the changes in model parameters. And there's really two ways that you can approach this that are not mutually exclusive. Uh, you can either assume that um, air pollution changes um, health capital, delta, alpha, or I. Delta and alpha became, uh, behave pretty similarly um, in uh, this uh, model. I is a little bit um, different, but I don't think I have time to go into uh, more details. And then this will produce both short and long run effects on mortality. The short run effects will be calibrated to uh, whatever the uh, regression estimates tell you they should be, and that's what allows you to uh, 
um, calibrate the model. And then the long run effects is something that you can simulate by basically assuming that future pollution, well, you can turn off the pollution shock or you can turn on a permanent shock and then potentially have non-additive uh, interactive effects over time because this model um, you know, is, is highly non-linear. Um, alternatively, or in addition to, you can model this as a change in the death threshold uh, in bar, and that will generate short-run mortality displacement. So um, here to give you an example, these are the um, estimates, the IV estimates for the effects of sulfur dioxide on uh, mortality following a one-day change in sulfur dioxide over various days since exposure. Um, and here, you know, we, we sort of see that the delayed effects are uh, increased, uh, are there on average, but we assume that 50% um, is going to be due to the mortality uh, displacement or an increase in H lower bar. So we calibrate the model, um, the change in uh, parameters uh, to match the regression estimate for same day um, exposure. Um, half, you know, and I guess, you know, maybe something closer to 30% is more appropriate, but I, we're going with um, half for now. And then we run the model forward for 28 days. Um, and so here's what the model predicts. If you calibrate, so this is just calibrated using one day exposure, everything going forward uh, is uh, completely, uh, you know, uh, separate, independent from the actual IV. Uh, estimates and overall it uh, pr fits pretty well, right? So if I were to put confidence intervals over here, they, the uh, red line model predictions would be within the confidence intervals of the actual IV um, estimates. So this model is flexible enough and realistic enough to at least fit the estimated patterns well within the time window over which we have, you know, good statistical power to uh, measure the delayed effects um, ourselves. And then, um, you know, if we're willing to be very brave, uh, we can actually run this model on uh, an entire cohort and increase uh, SO2 by one unit to see what happens to uh, long run survival. Uh, and here, you know, we have the choice of whether to uh, go with alpha, delta, or I. Um, we're keeping the H lower bar at 50%, um, as we said. Um, now, alpha and delta deliver very similar predictions. So our baseline uh, life expectancy based on the 1972 uh, table calibration is 74.8 uh, years. Um, the model predicts that a one unit increase uh, in SO2 would lower survival. So suppose air pollution levels had gone down by one unit um, fewer, uh, would have lowered survival by uh, 0 0.6 to 0 0.7 um, years. Um, now, uh, it gives you a less realistic um, estimate, so it does matter what parameter you assume is changing. Um, but I actually argue in the paper is not... Um, a good parameter to uh, shock because it doesn't match uh, the predicted patterns by age that we see in the data, right? So we can also use regression estimates to inform ourselves which parameter should be changing. Uh, in the case of I, if, if the effects of pollution were kind of uh, operating in this uh, uniform fashion, affecting the latent health of everybody um, equally, then we'd expect to uh, see more younger people dying and we don't these estimates are both um, reasonable and they're um, uh, consistent with the patterns that we see in the data. And notice that so here, you know, basically air pollution uh, changes starting from birth, but really the, the two curves deviate from each other uh, at older ages. Um, and this is because, of course, we're capturing these scarring effects. So uh, our model doesn't predict as a result of um, air pollution, uh, partly because alpha and delta most affect old people, but more infants become um, scarred. So we basically estimate that um, compared to what you would uh, were to do if you were to take our um, naive estimates uh, based on short run and um, 
you know, multiply them uh, using this model uh, about doubles the estimated mortality effect uh, of, of air pollution compared to just using uh, the shorter run um, estimates. Um, okay, so uh, this uh, is what I think a promising way forward is. Um, definitely, you know, we need to grapple with the fact that uh, while our studies have been very well identified, they haven't delivered the estimates that policymakers uh, really want, which is what happens to life expectancy, right? What happens over um, the longer uh, run? And you know, if we want to uh, compete with and supersede the epidemiological um, estimates, uh, then we need to be able to see these um, kind of impacts. Now, I'm not saying that studies that exploit um, a longer outcome windows or longer lasting pollution shocks are not valuable. Um, but as I've mentioned, there's other issues that come up with these studies. So I think we need to kind of attack on both fronts and pursue uh, good uh, long run variation in air pollution if we can find it. You know, so far we haven't found that $20 bill uh, on the sidewalk, at least uh, not many uh, good ones. Uh, but, uh, but that doesn't mean it's not worth uh, looking more and thinking about you know, issues of offsetting investments and, and relocation and uh, so on. Uh, but I also think that we should take more seriously this idea that of combining well-identified short-run estimates with structural models of um, health so we can better speak to what the welfare costs of uh, air pollution uh, are. And I think I will uh, stop here to not prevent you from enjoying the beautiful outdoor weather and see if there is any questions.